This week, Japan's love of robots lay bare. They're training, battling, dancing, and diving into danger. I've worn plenty of protective suits in my time, but they've always been to protect the environment from my body. This time it's different. I've come to one of the most infamous locations on Earth. Until 2011, Few people had heard of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in northeast Japan. And then, the largest earthquake in Japanese history changed everything. The resulting tsunami killed more than 20,000 people, and the 14-metre wave overwhelmed Fukushima's flood defences. Ironically, it was the power station's cooling system that was flooded, and when it shut down, the radioactive fuel rods began to overheat and melt down. They reacted with the steam around them, filling units one, two, three, and four with hydrogen gas, which then exploded. Six and a half years on, the melted radioactive fuel remains somewhere inside these buildings. Humans can't go anywhere near that fuel, and so robots are being used first to try and find it, and eventually to remove it. And today, we've been given rare access to the site to help us understand just how hard that job is. In order to work out how to decommission the reactor and remove the fuel, we have to survey and understand the state of the interior. Only then will we know what kind of tools or machines we need to develop. It's probably the most important thing that I'm going to carry for a long time, dosimeter. It tells me how much radiation I've been exposed to. The Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, is keen to show us, and I guess the world, how much of the radioactive debris has now been removed and how it's now possible to walk around most of the site without too much protective clothing. But to really understand the challenge the robots face in finding and removing the melted radioactive fuel, we do need to suit up. We're going inside Unit 5, which is identical to the units which were wrecked by the explosions. As you can imagine, it's really hot inside these seats. It's a confusing jumble of walkways and machinery, and it's difficult to appreciate that somewhere in here is a seven-storey high tank of water called the primary containment vessel, the PCV. And now it's time to go right underneath the reactor. Oh, wow. They think what happens after the meltdowns is that the molten fuel just burned through the bottom of the PCV and came down here onto what's known as the pedestal. That's where they think the fuel is now. It's difficult enough getting around this place on foot. Now imagine trying to remote control a robot through this after the whole place has been mangled by an explosion. Oh yes, and do it in the dark. Each of the reactors suffered different damage. Some are still full of water, some are dry. And so Toshiba has built a special robot for each one. As important as how they move about is how they get in in the first place. We need something that could fit through an existing service hatch. That's the reason we made small robots. This is Scorpion. 
its mission was to hunt for fuel in Unit 2. Now, time is of the essence for any Fukushima robot. The radiation will eventually damage and disable its cameras, rendering it useless. But the entire mission can also be upset by something far more basic. This is Service Hatch X-6, and in Unit 2, they were hoping to send the Scorpion robot down this ramp to film the molten fuel at the bottom, but it got caught halfway down. It never made it, so they didn't get any footage or any evidence of where the fuel was. In unit three, the water's much higher. So they had to think of another way to get a robot in to film what was going on. And that's where the mini sunfish came in. Well, actually, that's where the mini sunfish came in. Built to fit through this 15 centimetre pipe, Mini Sunfish is a tiny underwater robot with five propellers, two cameras and four human operators. 300 kilometres away from Fukushima, in Toshiba's Yokohama R&D centre, I came face to face with the star of the investigation. After two months of practice in a duplicate of the flooded pedestal, in July this year, Mini Sunfish was successful in finding melted clumps of material that could be fuel debris on the pedestal in Unit 3. One of the reasons there's so much water in the reactor buildings is because groundwater is leaking in and it needs to be pumped out. The problem is it can't be pumped out into the sea. There's still about 150 tonnes of groundwater leaking into the site every day. And although they can use some of that groundwater to cool the fuel rods, it all gets contaminated. So they need to store the excess in these tanks. Each one holds 1,200 tonnes of water. And there are currently 900 of these tanks here. It's obviously impossible to keep building these tanks at the rate of one every eight days. I don't know what they're going to do with them. Ever. So how do you stop groundwater from leaking in in the first place? Well, you build an ice wall. Pipes of coolants have been inserted 30 metres into the ground and they're gradually freezing the soil and stopping anything from seeping through. It sounds completely nuts, but how else would you do it? That is an ice wall underground. Having been criticised in the early stages, it now seems TEPCO is working hard to make Fukushima safe. It's rebuilt and reinforced working areas, sealed the soil in concrete and reduced radiation levels. In our four-hour visit, we received the radiation dose equivalent to four dental x-rays. But there is such a long way to go. Decommissioning the site could take 40 years and it may cost 8 trillion yen. The human cost is more difficult to quantify. The exclusion zone has left many people homeless, unable to stop nature from reclaiming their post-apocalyptic ghost towns. They can't go back until the radioactive fuel is recovered. Those little robots have a lot riding on their tiny backs. They say in Japan, you're never more than six feet away from a robot. OK, actually, they don't say that, but it does feel like it. And behind many of Japan's most iconic creations are two robot visionaries. Hello, everybody. This is Professor Hiroshi Ishiguro. And this... Hello, everybody. I'm a Geminoid. I'm a copy of a Professor Ishiguro. Geminoid HI4 is a robot created by Professor Ishiguro in his own likeness and has even been used to fill in for him during lectures that he couldn't attend. We are looking for the definition of humans by creating a very human-like robot. So that is our final goal. Our purpose is not just to develop a robot, but to understand the human itself. The lab has developed a number of human-like robots, from receptionists to school teachers, and is looking at how to create empathy between humans and robots. Hiroshi believes that soon we may see far closer relationships between us and our electronic counterparts. Of course, you know, that we want to give a, a human right to the robot. Then, you know, we want to have the robot going to be our partners. 
And therefore, you know, if uh, people wa want to have a marriage with a robot, we should allow it. We may find the uh, humanities on the robots. We believe this is uh, our futures. Thank you so much. But not everyone is trying to build robots in our own image. This is Professor Tomotaka Takahashi, and this is his lab at Tokyo University. He's been designing robots for decades. If technology was no object, where would you like to see robotics head? Robot for communication can be the interface between human beings and other devices or internet or services. So we uh, all have uh, our own tiny robot like a Jiminy Cricket in uh, Pinocchio. It's so stupid to put everything together, like we don't do toaster and the toilet and the car and uh, that, that you know, like microwave together. Doesn't it? A toaster, <laughs> a toilet and a car. <laughs> if you Get me to the baiting office. <laughs> So tiny might be the aim, but that doesn't mean that these robots are all looks. This is one of his latest projects, Robohon, released last year. It's a tiny robot that's also a phone. Hello! <laughs> and a projector. So it's a projector. And you keep it in your pocket. There's a clip. Oh, there's a clip. Oh, I did mention it also dances, didn't I? This is a very practical... Yes, and sophisticated. Sophisticated and, and easy to carry mm, around. Yes, Not so a, easy to carry yeah, around a robot. Actually, twice as expensive as iPhone. Right, OK. Mm. So how do you think people will be persuaded to, you know, yeah. switch a black rectangle for a, a robot? Mm. Well, actually, smartphone is so sophisticated and it's almost perfect, but there's only one shortcoming, which is Siri. Siri is so smart, but people still don't use that in daily life. And, uh, but we can talk to pet fishy or you know, turtle or <laughs> even teddy true. bear. Yeah. So the problem is it has square shape like this. If it has uh, animal shape or human shape, we are willing to talk to them. If we're going to talk to our devices as if they're humans, then it would certainly help if they look a bit more humanoid. And if we want to do that anytime soon, then maybe little guys like these are the answer. Hello and welcome to The Week in Tech. It was the week that Mark Zuckerberg apologised for using hurricane damage in Puerto Rico as a backdrop for showing off Facebook's new VR function. This in the same week that he announced his hopes to take VR mainstream to a billion people with the launch of Oculus Go next year, a $200 standalone device. A new generation of Tamagotchi has been announced. 20 years on from the original battery-operated pet craze, a smaller, simpler version brings nostalgia and pointlessness to 2017. And Microsoft say Windows 10 phones are no longer their focus, with no more hardware or features being developed. Having only claimed 0.03% of the phone market, it's probably not much of a surprise. What has been claimed to be the largest ever energy-generating walkway has been built at the Berlin Festival of Lights. The 26 square metres of path converts footsteps into off-grid electrical energy. And finally, MIT's Computer Science and AI Lab has developed a way to see around corners using a smartphone. It'll detect an object or a person through the light reflection that they produce. The aim is that it could help self-driving cars or even search and rescue teams, also handy for playing hide and seek. At Japan's Olympic Training HQ, a top secret project is finally unveiled. Any guesses? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Block Machine, the volleyball playing robot. Over engineers? I'll let you judge, but it's hard not to appreciate the ambition 
And here, where it's normally used to put the country's female youth volleyball team through their blocking paces, they say it solves a crucial problem that the Japanese women players face. After winning bronze in the London Olympics, we were aiming for gold in Rio. We actually came third in the world, yet we were the smallest in height. We wanted to give the team opportunities similar to practicing against taller foreign players. That's the reason for this machine. So, with not enough tall women to practice against, the University of Tsukuba designed the robot and the interface, which lets you simulate the speed, height and typical formations of different international teams. And it has proved invaluable. Without the block machine, our players wouldn't have had much practice against opponents of height. So I think block machine contributed considerably to our bronze medal in the World Championship. There are plans, ultimately, to use computer vision to have the machine respond automatically to play. But right now, well, it's still one of the best video games I've played for a while. Oh, yes. It's a remote control robot. I get to choose where the hands go, left, right or middle, and how many hands. Oh, bad timing there. OK. Oh, what? <laughs> of course, volleyball's not the only thing getting a technological boost in the run-up to the Tokyo 2020 Games, as Dan Simmons has been finding out. Tokyo 2020, and while the city will no doubt put on a brilliant Olympic Games, Yoshiaki Sawabi isn't so sure when it comes to the Paralympics. And that's worrying because he's one of the organisers. ロンドンはパラリンピックがね、あの観客が満員になりました。でもリオは前に果たしてできるのかという心配からこれを作りました。理解は進んだんですが、そこから実際に競技を見に行こうというなかなかそういう動きには今なっていません。このままでは本当に東京パラリンピックは危ないと。And it really is a workout for the upper body. Well, I guess it depends on how much you put into it. Oh, Leanne, I'm moving to the right-hand side of the course. I want to give you more than just a normal experience. I want to give you more than just a normal experience. I want to give you more than just a normal experience. I want to give you more than just a normal experience. I want to give you more than just a normal experience. I want to give you more than just a normal experience. It's an exhilarating ride, and 3,000 people have already tried it out since the spring. Outside the office, we caught up with the 1 to 10 team at Japan's premier annual new tech expo, SeaTech. This is Bochia, another Paralympic event that can be played by competitors with varying degrees of disability. But again, it's able bodied people that Yoshi wants to get involved and interested in this sport that's been a highlight of Paralympics in the past. He's got three years to raise its profile to the Japanese public. This is a half-size automated version of the game space. Sensors keep track of the jack and balls in a game similar to bowls. The flashing lights and automated scoring help to draw players in. And the company's in talks with arcades, shopping centres, even bars to open the experience up to the public. Yokiyashi's been in a wheelchair for 20 years, so on a practical level, I asked him if Tokyo was ready to welcome other wheelchair users. しかし、多くの人が来た時に、1人か2人だったら大丈夫なんだけど、多くの人が同時に来た時には、まだ全く機能していません。3年間でもっともっとインフラをですね、整備していかないといけないというのが東京の現状ですね。
Downstairs, I'm being scanned in 3D as tech specialist Michael shows me the company's new toy. They want to work out what makes a winning performance. This kit could be used to capture all athletes at their best and analyse precisely the movements they used to win. But remember, entertainment is as important to these guys as learning, so they've given me a few new moves. Not sure it's good enough for the gold, though. For the last leg of our Japan trip, I wanted to show you something of a Japanese tradition happening deep in the countryside, far away from the Blade Runner streets of Tokyo. It's Sunday morning, and at this high school in the small town of Tendo, dozens of pupils have gathered for a sumo match. That's robot sumo, of course. Yep, today I've come to watch a regional heat of a national competition which is now in its 25th year. And with several spots up for grabs in the final, nothing is being left to chance. The winner is the first bot to get the other one out of the ring twice. If that hasn't happened within three minutes, then the winner is the first to one point. Although if a bot flips over or if it stops working, then the match is over. Or maybe they'll give them some extra time if it's really fun. You'll get the idea. They can't even push them across the floor. How is this going to work? The rings are made of steel, and the sumo bots have really strong magnets to simulate the mass of real sumo wrestlers to give them the best chance of not being flipped. But the fact that the umpires need to wear shin guards probably tells you that this doesn't always work. Stop. Here we go. Yeah, it's quick. And the reason is that once the bots are left alone, these matches are taking place entirely autonomously. These machines are attempting to outthink and outsense each other in the blink of an eye. Someone who knows how best to gain those little advantages is 17-year-old Armani Mori. Her dad came second in the very first school robot sumo competition. Last year, she came third. I'm trying hard to beat my father's record. That's what I'm aiming to do. He had a big influence on me. Tactics include having a black bot, which is harder for your opponent's sensors to see. The operator can also select a particular pre-programmed strategy for each bout. Yes, the programming needs to be superior to win, but I think having the best blade is the most important feature. Here she goes. I'm no expert, but that didn't smell good. But in the second round, Armani's expertise starts to show. As the day goes on, she conquers all before her. Until, just before the final, she crashes out. There's a strategy called feint where you back off before attacking, but the timing was off. The bot just went too early. Of course, win or lose, over the years, this competition has given thousands of students invaluable experience of robotics and programming. And of course, when you do get knocked out, you can still enjoy everyone else's smash-ups. Wow, what an exhilarating way to end this trip to Japan. Now, you'll find loads of extra photos from our journey on Twitter at BBC Click. We also live on Facebook. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you soon.